All right, and I see your screen. So, hey, perfect. Buddy, thanks for joining us this morning for our our last spring early summer small bites training. Um, we might start doing a few in the fall. We'll just kind of see how that goes. One really cool one that Chris Hamill and Chris AC or no, that's not right. Tom, Tom Boyve and Chris Hamela and I have talked about is doing one on um, on the mass rearing cages for purple loose stripe, but we may just, I think we're just gonna save that for the fall meeting since it looks like we're gonna be in person. So that's exciting. But this morning we've got Jake Dickman, who he's our IS guy and he is well known to all of you, of course, but he's gonna go over the viewers that we use a lot of. He can he can get into it a lot more than what I did when we went through the swims trainings. And then um, also uh, the where boaters have been to will. And as we're, as he gets going, go ahead and put, you know, what's your number one or two top questions you run into when you're using any of these tools? Um, what you can think of even before he gets started. And of course, we'll take questions after that. So just put those into the chat and I'll keep track of those and we can discuss those after he goes through some things. So I'm handing it over to Jake. All right, thanks Jeannie. Um, so yeah, as Jeannie mentioned, uh, I'm the SWIMS database manager uh, for those that you might not know me, um, but I also help manage and work with the uh, various DNR mapping tools, surface water data viewer, um, the lakes and rivers, or the lakes and aquatic invasive species mapping tool, and our um, where boaters have been, clean boats, clean waters, uh, data mapping tool. Um, a lot of this data drives directly from our DNR databases, SWIMS, um, the register of water bodies, row, um, And so a lot of the data that you enter or citizens collect um, or other partners enter uh, into our databases, they appear on our surface water data viewer or lakes and AIS viewer or where boaters have been tool. Um, so uh, as Jeannie mentioned, if you have any specific questions on what you want to go over or if you want to have me do a particular task, um, we can go ahead and do that and Jeannie will kind of monitor that. Um, but uh, I'll just give a quick overview of each of the mapping tools, um, go through a few uh, uh, things that I know I've done in the past, um, uploading data, exporting data, um, situations like that, and we can go from there. All right, so the Surface Wire Data Viewer um, is kind of our uh, bread and butter uh, data mapping tool. Uh, I use this most frequently, um, especially when it comes to water quality data or locating stations. Um, uh, on different water bodies within a lake or a river segment. Um, so here is the landing page for the Surface Wire Data Viewer. You can click this button to open the mapping tool itself. Um, but below, we also have a little more information on the different themes that we have in the Surface Wire Data Viewer, um, wetlands, dams, floodplains, um, designated waters, um, and fish advice, so fish consumption advisories. And then below is a little documentation um, section where you can have uh, frequently asked questions, a uh, surface water data user guide, um, and like a little overview of the surface water data, views, data viewer. We don't have um, a very similar uh, web page for the lakes and AIS mapping tool, um, but a lot of what is covered in the surface water data viewer uh, guides and frequently asked questions will translate to the Lakes NIS mapping tool. So um, feel free to use those resources. So when you open up the Surface Water Data Viewer, you'll see uh, this screen um, with a variety of different tabs and buttons at the top. Um, the one I use most frequently is the Show Layers. Um, uh, when you upload the data, or uh, when you open up the Data Viewer, you'll automatically have um, a variety of information automatically loaded, um, such as base maps, um, surface water, um, cities, roads, and boundaries. Um, but you can add in a lot of additional information. So we scroll in on here and, oh, look, there's Dickman Lake. Um, <laughs> you can open up uh, air photos and pull up um, uh, aerial view um, of different years. And this leaf off air 
photos is what I use most frequently and um, I think is the better quality imagery that we can use. Um, and say if you were looking at a particular water body and you wanted to um, take off the, the water or the surface, surface water layer, you can either unclick that and then you just have your base aerial imagery um, or you could leave it on and then just scroll this over so it's not there anymore. If you were to unclick this and to then click on that water body, you would just pull up this kind of um, county level information. Um, you can automatically click on certain features and it will show you a little bit about that feature. So just find that county. Uh, but if you were to leave it on and then click on this water body, you can scroll over and you can see a little bit more information about that water body. Um, so Dickman Lake, the Wibbick, um, and then there's uh, links for about the water. You can go to the lake page itself and you can add it to results and you can view additional details. So if you click view additional details, it will zoom right into it. You'll find a little bit of information about the water body. Um, more information will definitely uh, pop up if you have um, um, additional layers pull in. Um, so if you click that, uh, and one thing you'll also notice is that our hydro um, does not always match with what um, uh, the actual imagery looks like. Um, so if we were to pull in the digital topographic map layer, you'll see that from when these surveys were first done and maps were first created, that we based all of our hydro features off of the topographic map. So, and again here, like there's technically no water body here. Um, and for those you don't know, this is my family's property. So um, shameless little plug for my family's property and like, <laughs> um, there is no water body there anymore. So some of this information is out of date, um, but still very current and usable in a lot of other areas. Um, and so a little more, uh, you can find um, areas for monitoring sites and data. And so if you're looking for say stream crossings, um, you want to do some aquatic face of species monitoring in the area, um, you can pull up and maybe take off the air photos because that takes a little time to load in certain areas. And then we'll pull them in the surface water again. When you click on this, it will automatically load in monitoring station points, lines, and areas. And so you can see points will show up as triangles. Um, new stations with no data will be green stars. Um, stations with more than 10 years old or older data will show up in this gold color. Um, and stations that are uh, in a yellow triangle are stations that have recent data within the last 10 years. Um, similarly here, um, you'll see you know, areas for the deepest location. Uh, these stations right here are called area stations. Uh, and so these are these big yellow blobs. Um, I tend to just kind of turn those off because it's not a, a great yellow color, um, so to speak, but uh, those are the different stations that you can pull in to um, uh, the surface water data viewer. Uh, now these stations aren't available in the lakes and AIS viewer, um, but I'll go over a way where you can pull in data to a particular viewer um, that might not be housed in that viewer itself. Um, and I'll, I'll give an example uh, after the lakes and AIS viewer overview. Um, and one little thing you can do is say, you know, an aquatic vase of species was found at the Milwaukee River crossing Highway 45 right here. Um, and you want to see what other water bodies might be, you know, at risk um, within a five mile range or, you know, a mile range. So you can click on this station right here and you can click add to results. And we'll go ahead and click these three little dots right here. And you can click show buffer options. So you can buffer this out to a particular distance. So you can go by feet, miles, um, meters, kilometers. So we'll just go 
one mile, and then we'll write that to drawing layer. So that will write this particular buffer to the drawing layer itself. And we'll go ahead and click continue. And so right there, we can see, um, you know, maybe not a lot of water body, uh, our, you know, different water bodies fall within that mile range, but you can um, definitely go ahead and like, uh, download this data. You can then export it to CSV, uh, um, a shapefile, uh, Excel spreadsheet, um, and you can download that into a spreadsheet, um, pulling in the different stations that are within that one mile range. So that's kind of something if you have a high priority species in your area, um, you can click and do this with a water body itself as well. So we'll go ahead and do Mothy Lake, add to results. I got to close that. Or you could do it this way, show buffer options. And um, we'll do five miles this time and write to drawing layer. And so there you can see within a five mile range, there's a lot of stations, a lot of water bodies, um, 49 stations um, with old data, 54 with new, 60 rivers and streams. Um, 166 lakes and open water. So uh, that's a way you can kind of visualize like, oh, there's a lot of water bodies within that five mile range that could potentially, you know, you know, be at risk for exposure to uh, different aquatic invasive species if they don't have it. Um, so that's a little tip and trick for uh, the surface water data viewer that you might not have been aware of, or you might not have had in other trainings. Um, there are yep, a variety of different information you can pull in. Um, so boat landings and access points. Um, so you can see a fishing point here, uh, boat access point right there. Um, uh, in the orange, there's a carry-in access point. Um, and then different information as well. So um, you can't break anything if you're trying to load different stuff into the, the viewer or you know pull in different layers. So um, you guys are good to go you know, play around with it, but hopefully that you know buffer option and um, on stations or a water body is something you can find useful uh, going forward with invasive species management. Uh, next will be the lakes and aquatic invasive species uh, mapping tool. Similar, you can just hit proceed and open up the mapping tool itself. And there'll just be a little disclaimer and you can click I accept. Um, so uh, it looks very similar to the surface water data viewer and a lot of our other um, DNR mapping tools, um, but it has a lot of different layers already uh, pulled into it. Um, so there's a, a layer for monitoring. So volunteer water quality monitoring that will pull in um, little secchi disks for um, our CLMN volunteers. Um, and depending on the layer and the region, so Vilas County might have a little more time to load uh, because there are a lot of volunteers in a dense population in that area. And so you see all those little secchi disks and that will show up at like the deepest location usually. Um, so that's kind of an indication of a, a monitoring station. Um, but then you can pull in uh, Project Red monitoring, AS volunteer monitoring, again, by um, Citizen Lake volunteers. And that will show up little um, green boxes around the lakes or green lines around the lakes. Um, another thing um, that we, we have in our uh, lakes and atmosphere is uh, water clarity. So a lot of our volunteers um, go out on certain days that a uh, satellite is overhead. And a lot of that data gets processed, and then we can look at satellite drive water clarity. And so the deeper colors mean a, a satellite drive deeper water clarity reading. Um, the lighter colors indicate a, a, a lower. And you can, uh, and so I guess one difference between the surface water data viewer to the lakes and atmosphere is that in the surface water data viewer, um, you're automatically able to just click on a water body or a feature and it will pull up that information. 
on the surface uh, on the lakes and atmosphere, you'll have to click the uh, identify tool to then be able to click on a particular feature. Um, so just one little nuance, uh, it, uh, that's something that we could should probably update to allow for right away. Just click on the feature, the water body, and pull in this information. Um, but just a little note to make of, you'll, you'll have to click on the identify tool and then point, or um, you can do a freehand shape and we'll pull in information like that. So I'll go ahead and disk click that. And then probably the biggest thing on this particular viewer is the different uh, invasive species that we have in here. So we do have drop downs for um, a variety of aquatic invasive plants, uh, fish, invertebrates, um, wetland plants. And so you can, let's do that. And we'll pull in a curly leaf pod weed. Um, uh, all verified curly leaf pond weed um, uh, observations in this area. And so there might not be a lot in this area. Um, you can see that in you know the lower part of Ilis and then top part of Oneida, um, these water bodies have a verified population of curly leaf, leaf pondweed. Um, and points will show up as this box and check mark. Uh, in general, um, we might not use that for whole lake areas. So that will be in a box. Um, if a particular water body has a uh, verified population, it will be in a line. Um, this might be more pertinent to, say, a wetland invasive where it's just maybe one plant in the area. Um, then you can also can pull in uh, no longer observed. Um, that will just typically be a, um, you know, outlined or um, a whited out, just an outlined area. I don't know if we'll have very few or very many no longer observed, but um, that is one option as well. And so, yeah, there's a different variety of uh, invasive species you can pull in uh, or pull the layers up and then see where they're at. Um, so if we have starry stonewort, mostly down in this portion of uh, the state itself, um, they'll show up as um, uh, different colored observations. Um, and you can see that right here. It'll be more of a, a blue color. Um, and so you can pull in different water or different um, features, et cetera. And similarly, you can click on that particular water body. Um, I will do a point. And we'll do a open water. And we'll zoom to it. And you can do similar buffer options, you know, one mile, right to drawing layer and click continue. So you can see based off of this particular water body, you know, here's one mile of buffer around that area. Um, and so that's a quick overview of the Lake Snayas viewer. Um, I guess a quick time check. Um, do we want have any questions, Jeannie, that might pertain to the, the two different viewers? Um, Matt, well, I asked why there's no N, a second N on your lake, but probably more importantly. Um, That's a story. <laughs> he's curious of, on exporting AIS species reports from area. Is that possible to do from the viewers? On exporting AIS. Yeah, sure. the question, the question. yeah uh, Jake, what I'm thinking is like basically, I have to do township maps for uh, Dane County. And okay. so if I could draw like a, uh, if I could click into a certain township area and mm -hmm. then export the different uh, AIS that were present there. You said you could export stuff like in that Excel file. So I could either do that or make maps. Just, there's a way to like pull, pull data from visually. I know you could do that in swims to some extent, but if there's a way to do it visually on the data viewer, that would be cool too. Yeah, um, let's see if I can do that real quick. Um, see if there's different layers. Um, so we'll pull open this 
the boundaries. And so you can, you know, pull in your uh, township section range, uh, quarter to quarter information. Um, so maybe we'll just pull in those and uh, let's pick an area. Oh yeah, Mendota, that'd be perfect. Um, I'm sure there's curly leaf in that area and Eurasian. Um, yes, you should be able to uh, pull that information and export that out. So let's do particular township. Um, show buffer options. If you just want to buffer like for that point or that small little area, just go to one foot and then it will just kind of buffer all of that just township. It will buffer out of the township a little bit, um, but you have to like put a small value there. Um, and you should be able to then export that township information from that drawing layer. So your identify results right here, you should be able to export that out into an Excel spreadsheet. Oh, and cool. we will see if it works. Um, works well. So you'll have your kind of township and you'll have, um, yeah, a little metadata and some information there as well. Uh, county boundaries, and you'll see Dane County. Um, you will have, yeah, you should be able to have your kind of verified areas. Um, I don't know if they'll point, so I don't know if it's necessarily giving you, uh, it does give you a geometry right here. Um, what coordinate system that is, I'm, I'm not, entirely certain maybe we can look into updating that to exporting out um decimal degrees or uh degrees minutes seconds something like that yeah um would be good for me except that looks like probably good but i'm sure it's uh, yeah. correct yeah I, I think you could import that in it's, it's, it's a coordinate system um fortunately i'm not a. Uh, I don't know gis too well but um yeah, you will be able to at least get a list of the water bodies uh, and features and stuff that does have presence of uh, curly leaf pondweed or EWM, stuff like that. So um, that is something that you can do from uh, either of the viewers, um, most likely the lakes and sphere if you're looking for invasives. And so every different species that you clicked on in the layers would be what exported? Yep. Yes, exactly. Um whatever you have uh, pulled into your uh, layer list um, right here, and then it is buffered into that particular feature. So if I were to click on, say, uh, this particular township, have that highlighted and write that to the drawing layer, um, it will then change your like identify your results tab down here so you would then have to, you know, export this particular thing. But once you click on here, um, you know, you'll have to play around with it a little bit. Um, you'll have to, you know, do the township and then kind of go back to that drawing again and buffer it. Um, so you won't have that kind of stored, like the eight or different townships you select on stored. Um, but yeah, that, so that is something you'll have is, you know, depending on the, particular feature and uh, object you put to the drawing layer that will should download all the information that is in that area itself. Cool. And if, yeah, if you can either figure out what, uh, how to get lat longs exported or how to, what, I don't, if anyone else on the call or is a GIS geek knows what that other <laughs> coordinate system was, it's probably based just, just basically upon this database. Um, if there was a Rosetta stone to convert it or something, that'd be cool too. But that's, that's cool, yeah. though. That's kind of cool. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure what that is. WTM, maybe. Um, but anyway, uh, real quick on the second question. Um, back in the 40s when World War II was going on, my family changed the name to one end to be less German, and then half the family changed it back to two ends, and the other half kept it with one end. So that's why it's Dickman Lake with one end. So you know, fun fact. <laughs> that is a fun fact. Yeah. Um, there weren't any other questions. So how about that? Where boaters have been to? Yeah, we'll do that. 
um, one real quick. Uh, so it's very similar. It doesn't have a lot of um, the same interactive um, options as like the, the viewers do. Um, so on our main Clean Boats, Clean Waters webpage, um, you'll go down to, to access this. Um, and I recommend putting these all into like a, a folder favorite. So I have you know, a variety of different um, DNR mapping tools. So uh, there's an ag runoff tool, trout tool for trout waters, public access, lakes and ass, boat access, motor, where boaters have been. Um, you'll go down and click the four watercraft inspectors and click on the where boaters have been link. And I believe we will be uh, redoing this tool. Um, this initially was in the Lakes and AIS viewer and having that in there along with all the other layers made it a very slow tool. Um, so now it's a lot quicker and faster being its own tool. Um, but I think going forward, we might revise it again um, if money allows and budget kind of works out with all that happened with COVID. Um, but it, it's kind of very basic right when you load it. Um, we'll go ahead and scroll into Green Lake County and we'll select on Green Lake. So it, it does slow a little or load a little slowly sometimes, but um, when you scroll in, um, different features will pull in. Um, so you can see like it won't be, you know, have all these uh, points on right away. But once you scroll in close enough, you'll see that this particular location has a boat access site has an AS sign installed, a volunteer inspector has been there and a paid inspector. So these might be your you know, grant recipients, but then also it has had in the past a volunteer um, record data there. When you click on the water body, we'll click on Green Lake. Now it won't look like you've clicked anything, but up here you'll see, you'll find the WIBIC water body identification code, official name, and then the verified um, aquatic base of species that are at this particular water body. And from there, you'll scroll down and you'll have two options where boaters have been prior to the last, uh, in the last five days. So the standard question, where have you been in the last five days? Or you could select where are you going after? So we just kind of re reverse that question and figured out where vol uh, boaters went two from Green Lake in the last five days. So say they were on, um, I think this is Puckaway. On Puckaway in the last five days and Green Lake was one of them, we reverse that question. So people went from Green Lake to Puckaway within five days. Um, anywho, you can click on this get detailed trip data and maybe we should update the color to not be red, it's triggering. Um, but um, that water body that you selected up on top will become red. And it will process a little bit depending on how much data is at the, um, you know, being loaded. Uh, eventually, as you see, everything in green will then show up um, as a water body that has been uh, there in the last five days. So they went to Green Lake and these were all the water bodies in green in the last five days. And so you can scroll in um, and you can see they were on the, uh, Mississippi, yes, Mississippi, um, you know, different lakes in Adams County. Uh, they were on Puckaway, Winnebago, all that. And you can see down below, you know, um, so they were on Lake Winnebago 89 times in the last five days. So this is all of the data within, you know, since 2004, whenever Clean Boats, Clean Water started or we started tracking it in the way we are now. Um, you'll see all the um, prior document or the um, verified aquatic invasive species at that particular water body. You can also see invasive species that were no longer observed. So big egg carp, um, there might not be a lot of those, but you'll see that. Um, so, and that's all there. And this is all data that was collected by um, watercraft inspectors. And so they'll submit that data. And then what we do on my end is we'll go ahead and read what people typed in. So sometimes like they'll butcher a name entirely. And so we either can't use that set of data or that observation because we can't, you know, figure out what particular water body that they're even trying to mention. Um, or say somebody uh, says like, oh, I've been on Bass Lake in Sawyer County. Well, like, there's a lot of Bass Lakes in Sawyer County um, and throughout the state. We unfortunately can't 
accurately say which fast lake that is. So that will not be recorded in this particular set of data. There's no way for us to figure that out. And we don't want to associate an inaccurate water body. Not every bass lake will have the same aquatic invasive species. So, and they might not have any. So that's something to keep in mind is that there are some lakes that might not be represented because we, we just, we just don't know, you know, you know, if they, and the public doesn't know like that there might be more than one bass lake or what township it is in and stuff like that. And so, yeah, you can export this set of data to Excel itself as well. And then additionally, um, if you do switch, this does change a little bit. Um, you'll still have to click get detailed trip data and then it should update. So um, in, in this case, 37 people, if we look at it this way, indicated that they were on Winnebago, but they were at Green Lake in the last five days. So we can say that 37 trips went from Green Lake to Lake Winnebago. So we just kind of reverse the question around and uh, are displaying data that way. And then, so that's kind of a quick little uh, overview of the where boaters have been tool. Uh, I think it's pretty cool. Um, I definitely had, you know, if we had more time, I would love it for say like arrows to go to particular water bodies that just gives a better visualization. And if you guys wanted to maybe export this out to a lake group or an organization, like that's a better tool to see like, oh, they're going this way versus just having color of water bodies. But um, this is still way better than it was in the Lakes and AIS tool, <laughs> I think. Yeah, that's come along. Um, we're right at time, but Emily has a question if you could, it says if you indicate yeah. someone was on a chain of lakes, does it still show up as usable data or does it go to the circular file? Um, yeah, so if somebody were to indicate that they were on, say, the Wapaka Chain of Lakes, early Chain of Lakes, or the Legend Lake of Chain, Legend Lake Chain, we don't, um, yeah, Legend Lake Chain right here, uh, we don't really recognize that as a particular water body anymore. We recognize them as singular water bodies, um, so in, in, at one time, this used to be all a single water body and it had, it own, had its own Wibic and we might reference certain points of data at that still, but really we will do these as separate water bodies. Um, I guess what I've been trying to do, and maybe it's not the, the correct thing, but obviously if this is a chain of lakes right here and there's Eurasian water milfoil, eh, chances are all these other individual lakes, which is really kind of one, has that species. So, you know, I might put just one of these water bodies or figure out a way to put all of these water bodies in there. Um, so like the Eagle River chain of lakes, you know, we might put just Eagle River or, um, you know, one of those lakes itself. It kind of gets you the idea of where they're going. Um, Again, this data is not 100% foolproof or accurate um, because, again, we're going based off of what people are saying. They could have, you know, said the name inaccurately and that person recorded it down wrong. And it's based off of what the person is writing on the paper and then translating to computer. So um, translation error, you know, lost in translation type of thing. Um, but we're doing our best to make sure that we have the most accurate data. And if, if we cannot figure out what water body to put, and we're uncertain, any little uncertainty, we're not going to include it. Um, so if you are training people on collecting data for clean boats, clean waters, um, you know, if they, you know, might hear a water body incorrectly or not understand it correctly, uh, if they can just ask for clarification, that would be great. Um, but not like badger them on like what township it is in and, you know, <laughs> that type of situation. Hopefully that answers the question. Tom wrote his work around as if he has someone come from a chain, he generally writes the lake down that with the most AIS. Yeah. A person that, that'll with really work good experience in the area to know that, um, which mm -hmm. sometimes you, your, your staff may or may not if you got interns or L other LTEs out there, but that's a workaround. Yeah, so there might be a little like kind of a, 
data management and maintenance on your end before the data are entered into the database. Um, but um, if you can, if not, then um, we aren't, you know, going out to these volunteers asking, you know, what this particular water body was supposed to be. Um, we're going through thousands, tens of thousands of records every year um, to pull into this and manually associating the WIBIC. So um, if we can get more accurate data on the front end before we do that, that's perfect. Um, so just uh, be mindful of that, I, I, I guess I'm asking. Good stuff. Well, we're out of time. So thank you everybody for sticking around for a few extra minutes because I think everybody was probably getting a lot out of that. Um, you know, we're I'm setting up the fall meeting to be in person with our fingers crossed really hard, of course. But um, if you want to hear more from Jake on stuff, you can always contact, you know, the DNR swims database email. And, and him, um, sometimes it helps to contact DNR swims at wisconsin.gov first because somebody else might see it that can help too. But um, if you have questions like on more that you'd like about this, let us know because maybe we could have Jake do some more of this at the meeting in the fall when we can, we'll have pretty much everybody there. Mm -hmm, definitely. So thanks everybody for joining us. I'm gonna stop the record.